Hello, and welcome to the podcast. This is Get in the Driver's Seat. We're telling stories about leadership moments in small to mid-sized professional practices. I'm your host, Sandra Beckor, Practice Management Coach at Beckor Management. I'm excited to introduce our guest today, Norman Bacall, the former national co-managing partner of Heenan Blakey. Norman grew the firm from scratch to over 200 lawyers. And now in his second career as author, consultant, and keynote speaker, he currently mentors young professionals and consults with law firm leaders across the country. So before we get into our discussion, I'd like to give a shout out to Gina Alexandris because Norm, you and I first met at her Career Conversations book club, where you were invited to speak about your book, Never Stop, for the YouTube watchers. This is what it looks like. <laughs> And given this synergy in our work today, we thought we'd talk about business development, such an important topic for lawyers and other professionals, and often a gap. So there are many points in the process where people get stuck. How about we begin at the beginning? (laughs) And so Norm, uh, can you think of any stories of a partner, an associate, even an owner of a firm? who didn't know how to get started with their own business development plans, but eventually found their stride. Uh, Well, I could, I could start with me. (laughs) All right. That's a good place. (laughs) Uh, Cause, because I can tell you for my first four years of practice, uh, I I was basically a servant to the partners in, in in the firm. I was working in Montreal at the time. And it it was, uh, you know, by Toronto standards, a fairly small firm. There were only 20 something lawyers and uh, I was a junior lawyer in the tax department. I had, I still remember my first day at work and walking around by the partner's offices and they were all on the phone. And the first question I asked myself was like, how do you get the phone to ring? Like, who, who is going to call me? Why are they going to call me? What are they going to want? And I still remember a lunch I had with uh, one of my, one of my friends who was also a fourth year associate. And uh, I think I told him at that point, I I said, I can't believe they pay me basically just to sit in my office and do research and answer questions. And he looked at me, gave me this odd look because uh, he had already figured out what I, what hadn't yet hit me on the head, which was just sitting around in my office and doing work that was assigned to me was a one-way ticket to nowhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took me another good year before uh before the lightning bolt strike and i i figured out for myself what i had to do so i think uh, and i think it's certainly the, the the case for much for many uh younger lawyers lawyers starting out and even lawyers some some of them particularly in bigger firms up in their eighth or ninth year of practice uh that have never uh have never been forced uh, whether by others or by themselves to go out and try and find a client so um it's and the, the biggest problem is nobody's teaching it so even the even the law firms assume you'll kind of figure it out or it'll come to you through the ether but there are, you know it you know there's law school will teach you the law but nobody teaches you uh how to succeed in business in the law but you said you eventually figured it out well what did you figure out <laughs> <laughs> you, you see the book just off to the side called take charge Yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, so, so I actually, I, I actually eventually wrote it down and did a TED talk about it. Uh, but what happened was uh, a year, or my review in my fourth year was basically Norm. You seem to have all the tools, but there's something missing. We can't tell you what it is, uh, which of course was extraordinarily frustrating because I had to, I had to fix something and I didn't know what. And it was my wife, my wife, Sharon, who actually put it in perspective. We spent almost all night talking about it. I was so upset. Uh, although that night I spent most of my time listening. And uh, she basically said, you're, you know, you're just not taking initiative. You're letting your career happen to you. You're not taking charge of what you're going to do next or how you're going to do it. And uh, it was shocking, but that was like... Uh, a switch a flip of a switch in my brain and it's not like i went in the next morning saying okay here here's my master plan to become a success and eventually a managing partner of a law firm you know that's going to be 1100 lawyers one 1100 this lawyers and staff one day 
but it was more like, uh, okay, from now on, I'm no longer sitting back. And that will apply to pretty much everything I do, every minute I spend, every meeting I take. Um, I'm going to be responsible for myself. I'm, I'm no longer relying on anybody. And that, and that was a first, of course, it was just a first step. But suddenly, uh, every file I got became, it was, was no longer a file. It was, a, okay, how do I take charge of this file? How do I create relationships out of this file? Um, and once I'd made that, that I call it a little mindset step, it was, it, you know, it, a, a leap, a, a leap for mankind, but the reality was it was just a little mind reset, uh, good things started to happen. Wow. That's a great story. So empowering. And I think relatable to, to many lawyers that are still at that mid level who, ha who don't see themselves that way as you know, it, they're the progress of their careers is really in their own hands to some extent. Yeah. It's funny because I, I did a, um, I did a webinar for a group of, I'll call them entrepreneurial lawyers in Vancouver. So it's any, anybody with a firm from one to 10 lawyers and uh, one being basically the sole practitioner out there. And uh, particularly since we've come out of, you know, four years of isolation and everything on Zoom and um, almost everything we do virtually, uh, I asked them, how many of you have gone out to visit a client instead of just taking a meeting on the phone or uh, by television or, or however you're doing it or, or communicating them by, with text, uh, by text, which is, I think, what most people do. And uh, no, no hands in the audience went up. Like nobody. Wow. Uh, here, here's a suggestion for you. <laughs> when you go visit a client or a client contact at their place of business, uh, you have the opportunity to take that single contact that you have and turn it into two. And if you go a second time, five. And if you go a third time, 10. And it gives you the opportunity on, on a much easier basis to find out about the business. Because if you're hanging around their shop, you're going to find out what their issues are. And what you're going to find out after you've made a series of these visits uh, is that you understand the business uh, eventually as well as they do. You see what the problems are. And you also see the problems coming down the road. Uh, even before they see them, and more important, before any of your competitors will see them. So, uh, I said that's part one. And then part two is, uh, for those of you who are worried that your contact in the organization is too junior and it's what it's a waste of time, um, I said there's no such thing as too junior. You need to be taking a long view of all of this development. You know, this person will eventually be senior somewhere. And you are likely going to be the only person who's taken the time to go meet them. And people remember that. Yeah. You know what this reminds me of? In this book, the, the one uh, I read, Never Stop, you made a point of talking, I, I think, um, you know, quite a bit about allyship, which, which to me is a really important topic. And when I coach, I really focus on this idea as well. The idea of building allies and making that sort of an intention in your business development effort. Um, I mean, I I personally think it makes your makes your business development efforts more sustainable, more enjoyable, <laughs> and more impactful. And and it just um it sounds to me like you're um, you're going there a little bit with with your own journey. Is is there anything you remember about building allies that helped you? Yeah. Um... I, I think I'll say the following. When, when you do work, good work for somebody, uh, they're naturally going to become an ally. You know, they're more likely to, to like you. If you leave it, however, to them uh, to make the, to take the next step. I, it's funny because I was, I was mentoring uh, a fourth year lawyer who had opened her own firm. And this is, this is now, this is now five years ago. And she is now one of the, you know, leading lawyers in her field in Toronto. But she was just getting started then. And it, it was a brave move. She'd left a big firm. She'd gone off to open her own shop. And she had done really good work on a particular file for a client. Um, and it was about, I don't know, 
a month a month prior. She was very proud of it. I said, fantastic. I said, so when are you having lunch with the client? So she said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you did good work for her. Are you just going to sit back and wait for the phone to ring till she needs you again? And she nodded her head. She said that, well, that's exactly what I was planning. And I said, I said, that's, you know, that's, that's not the best decision you can make. The best decision you can make right now is call the client for absolutely no reason and check in on the business or come up with one of five reasons to be calling. It doesn't really matter. You're just calling to check in. Let's go for lunch. Let's talk. I say, you want to build on the goodwill and don't wait for the next file because the next file may be two years away because she may see you as only being able to do that one kind of thing that you did for her. So, but if you call and meet and learn about her business, you, you will probably get all kinds of ideas of what else you can do for her. And that's you taking the initiative. And, and again, it's that, that, that's part of bu- building up the allyship. Yeah, it absolutely is. And, you know, the learning about the business, I, I don't think that people typically associate this part with business development, but I do. I really think it's essential. And so when you have those conversations at lunch or whatever you end up doing to get closer to your clients or to your referral network, that is about learning about their business and becoming a more valued valued person in their network. Um, there are other ways of doing that. I'd love to explore a little bit in our conversation. Just, you know, it's it's not just to rely on one way of doing it because sometimes people get in their own head and they're like, well, I'm not the golf type or I'm not the lunch type. Okay, cool. <laughs> so how about these other ideas? Would that work for you? And then maybe the lunch happens and, you know, by that time you're comfortable with it. Have, have you have you encountered other ways, maybe more modern or different or innovative? Um, golf was golf was was good only because it gives you it gives you six hours with someone, uh, and you don't ever have to be talking about business. You're spending six hours with someone, that, which is which is pretty good. But but the other thing I'd say, uh, and I think I'd I'd worry less about how you're going to do it than what you're going to do is. The other thing people really value uh, are people who can act as connectors. So we ha- we have this notion of networking as going to cocktail parties and handing out your business cards, which in my view is, uh, I hate to say it, it's a complete waste of time, but it's largely a complete waste of time unless you have a strategy and I'll get, we, we can deal with that later. But the reality is um, people people will will want you for two things one for the expertise you're develop you developed and two for the person that you know that can help them and if you can um if you can always if in each of your contacts with people you can figure out how they might fit into something else you're working on you're creating a value value for yourself that's way beyond you know a golf game or handing out a business card uh, or or any other form of networking. The best networking is is when you when you sit down, listen to something uh, somebody's working on, and and the light bulb goes off. Oh, I know Marie, and Marie is an expert in this field, and let me connect you with with Marie, and the three of us will get on get on a call together. So it's an excuse. The the one thing I would never do is make the contact and step out of the way entirely. You always want to keep yourself in the middle so you know what's going on and uh, develop an appreciation but you know i I used to tell my uh, my women lawyers you know forget about you know who'd say listen none of my clients are doing hockey or baseball or football or you know uh i said well you know what about a spa day you know if you want that if you want that hours where you really undress someone else and get to know everything about them i mean that's it um something different some something different, uh, but uh, as much as anything else, something you enjoy, right? So, and, and that is important because then you'll actually do it more than once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have some contacts now who you know will go on dog walks together. Wow, that's a great idea. Yeah, so we'll just and then you know you don't even have to be talking business. It's gonna it's gonna move there eventually, but you don't have to be talking business yeah. because. 
your dogs are going to bond you with nothing else. Right. You know, I, I actually, I think it's an important point that you're making to, that you don't have to be talking business because you are just your very presence is creating a bond. It's about showing you care. Yeah. And that's, you know, in the end, that's what people will remember. I, I felt I, I wanted it. I wanted it from my staff, but I also wanted it from my clients and, and the thing I think we all know in the back of our heads is we don't have a single client uh, in the world that somebody isn't trying to steal from us. Because after all, that's how we get all our clients. We're trying to take them from somebody else and show we're better or smarter or more devoted or you, you name it. Uh, we're trying to get a client who probably belongs, you know, is somebody else's client today. So, you you know, you can sit, sometimes you'll, you'll only get the opportunity when the other service provider, um, uh start showing they don't care or make some mistake but but you need to be at the ready when that day happens and you do that by showing the other person that you care about them and it doesn't have to be about you know let, let me tell you about the bills of exchange act because like i i know more about that act than anybody else like you know that's a surefire way to to get nowhere unless you know, unless i think you're trying to get hired from, by a university to be a lecturer on the subject, but right. uh, but for everybody else, it's more about um, you want to create in your your contacts and in particular in your clients this feeling that they don't understand that uh, the thought that goes through their head when the phone rings from the the person trying to steal them is I could never do that to Norm, I could never do that to Sandra, like you want that to be there gut reaction, whether they're thinking about it consciously or not. And you do that not because you're a great lawyer, but because they think you're a great person. Well, essentially, these bonds are based on values, shared values. Those are the strongest bonds. And I think that's what you're you're referring to. That's right. And, you know, and, and it doesn't it doesn't have to be because you're a nice person. You know, some, I, I still remember some of my cl clients were complete mercenaries and ruthless and heartless. And so that's what I was tapping into, uh, assuming I wanted them as clients. It's like, what's what's the commonality and There's how something. do we play into it? You know, OK, like, what's the next, you know, what's the next deal we could do, Norm? Like, you want that. You, OK, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like your partner in crime to figure out what's the next thing we're going to we're going to do together. And that's and that's the way I want your brain always working. What's the next thing we're, we are going to do together? Right. Partnership. To, what's the next piece of work I'm going to ask you to do because you're my servant and you're, mm -hmm. you're just going to do what I pay you for. As long as they see you as, you know, the the, the service provider uh, who's, you know, who's who's driven the best bargain, who, you know, can give them you know the, the most amount of results for the least amount of cost. I mean, that's one way of doing business, but it's completely transactional and you will lose every day to the next person along who can do it a little more efficiently than you. This is also about mindset, like what you were saying earlier, because this is about seeing yourself as a lawyer differently. You're seeing yourself as a partner to your clients as opposed to a service provider. I, I, and I think you, the, the, the mind, the big mindset change is that you have to see yourself as a value provider. Mm -hmm. And the question is how you provide value and each case will be a little bit different because each need will be a little bit different, but they have, to, you know, your clients have to see you as providing a value to them. And if they see that they're not going to leave you. And if they see that they will, you know, they'll do you little favors, like be connectors for you to other prospective clients. Right. I'd love to pick up on something you said earlier about, um, you know, the the lawyers who are at earlier stages in their career, mid-level, maybe even earlier, and how it's really, uh, it's not as common for them to be digging into their business development plans, but actually it's a good idea to get started as early as possible. And could you just share a little bit about your own experience with that concept? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll start with um, something uh, that later in my career, a, a consultant, um, and it was it was a famous consultant said uh, that I that I took to because it kind of reinforced what I'd always thought, and and he was saying that um, in practice about 
one, tw one quarter, 25% of your time needs to be devoted to the work you're going to be doing three to five years from now. Wow. <laughs> so um, put in harsher terms, there's a, there's a lawyer in Toronto by the name of Perry DeLells. Uh, he's the, 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 the lead partner in the firm, I think it's Wildeboard DeLells. Mm -hmm. uh, the board yeah, retired right. a long time ago, so it's basically Perry's firm. And uh, Perry told me, like, his goal was uh, to create one new contact every single day. That's like his goal was 365 new wow. contacts over the course of a year, which is which is a number which is even even by my standards insane. <laughs> uh, but it's worked for him. He's like one of the best business developers I think I've ever met. He puts all the rest of us to shame. But the, but the point is, you need to be spending a portion of every single week um, not working on your files. But and it it could be could be with the same clients. It's just going out, figuring out, okay, what am I going to do? How am I going to network them? Uh, who can I get them to introduce me to? Who can I introduce them to? Um, uh, and I've, I've made fun a couple of times of handing up your business cards at, at cocktail parties. Uh, I gave one mentee um, uh, who, who just reached out to me on LinkedIn uh, a few weeks ago. We had a Zoom session and I said to her, I said, listen, um, you're at the stage where you're probably going to a lot of these events, whether it's industry or um uh, or law related or whatever it is and you're handing out your cards and you have no idea what you're doing or why you're doing it you just know you have to do something like that i said it's a st i said stop wasting your time when you go to one of if, if you have an event that you need to go to as you go to that event knowing there are two people in the room you need to connect with so before you get there decide in advance who they are uh Find them, have your have your interaction with them, and then go home to your family. But stop, don't waste two hours at an event where you just actually you feel you feel the way I used to feel when I went to these events as a particularly as a junior lawyer. Like I need to be here because everybody thinks I need to be here. And if I, you know, if I if I don't go, I'm a failure. Uh, but the reality was I'd hang at the outskirts of the room waiting till I could finally leave. Like that that's just that's a waste of your time. Go home, go home to your family. But instead, decide, uh, don't just go to events. Go to events knowing, here's why I'm going, and here are the two things I want to achieve. And it could be as little as a five-minute conversation with a particular person or somebody you actually want to meet, uh, and your, your mission is to meet them and not exchange a business card, but come in thinking about, okay, what's, what's my line going to be? Or who can introduce me to that person, and what's and more important, what's the follow up going to be as a result? If I want to meet you, it's not so that I can meet you and then see you at the next cocktail party in six months. So I can meet you and and I can say, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? You know, the, the the best way to show your expertise is to ask questions like that. But but ultimately, uh, don't just go. Go do everything. You know, and and it's it's part of the mindset change. Everything. With, with a purpose in mind in terms of the business development. So when, when we were chatting before we got on this call, uh, you said something to me about at your previous role, you set the expectations very early for uh, anybody that you hired, that business development would be part of the role. And I encounter lots of owners, not just law firm owners, but owners of other professional services who actually hesitate to do that. And it's it's really, it's not helping them, right? They, they hesitate to put that onus on their team. And I think that they're losing out on a really big opportunity. What would you say to those owners, like what, to shift their view of this and to find an easy way of inviting their team into the business development plan? I'd say it, it would certainly hurt start uh, if you started that with um, with a bit of a brainstorming session and maybe you bring an outsider in to trigger. But there's, there's nothing like leaving a, an internal firm event with everybody all revved up about what they can do. 
whether it's a first year lawyer or a 10th year lawyer, where everybody leaves excited and motivated um, and it leaves that internal event saying, okay, here, here are the list of the, like, I, I never say, you know, come up with your, I used to say, come up with a business plan for the year. But normally what I'd say is, listen, your business plan only needs to be three things. Or you're, you're leaving this meeting. I just want you to write down three concrete things you're going to do as a result and then do them. Because, and, and it doesn't all have to be on day one. You know, week one, I'm, I'm going to do one. Week two, I'm going to do two. Week three, I'm going to be do three. I said, if one of those things works, you're way ahead. But I, but I think simply telling people, I want you to go out and do business development uh, is wasting your breath because no, you know, nobody knows how to do it when they're starting. I didn't know how to do it. <laughs> and I, was and I, I figured it out. And the, the other thing is, and what's even worse is they'll look at the rainmakers in the firm and, and I've worked with a few of them over time, you know, and I call a rainmaker like the classic rainmaker is the person who will get into the elevator with you on the first floor and have you signed up as a client, you know, before you get off on the 25th. You now I've worked with one or in my entire career, I think I've only known two people like that. And that was their expertise, but it, you know, it probably wasn't where, where they started, but we see them as the extroverts. Uh, you know, it's, it's way more important to teach people that you could be like me, which was, you know, who was and still is the complete introvert and teach them okay here are the acting skills you need or here are the techniques you need just do if you can learn technique a technique b technique c this will this will get you through you know tech technique d for me was like how do you survive a dinner at one of these dinners where you're sitting next to one person on each side and i used to be that person that after about three minutes i had nothing left to say to them they had nothing left to say to me and they were both pointed in the opposite direction and I'd be sitting there all night thinking to myself, failure, failure. When can I go right. home? Yeah. Anyway. And, you know, I learned a skill or two about how to get through an evening like that. And it was no more than uh, watch the evening news uh, or the or, you know, or, or CNN anytime and watch what the person behind the desk does with their interviewee. They just ask them a series of questions. And every time they get an answer, it triggers another question. If, if you do that with the person beside you, don't worry about making small talk. Ask them a question about themselves. It's usually everybody's favorite topic. And you will leave an evening like that. They may know nothing about you, but they'll think you're the most interesting person they've ever met. And that's a guarantee because I've, you know, I've heard that about other people who, you know, like the people who taught me how to do this. Yeah. So it's, it's all about, you know, it, so having a session where you're, where you're brainstorming about stuff like this, you know, triggers, you know, triggers something in people's brains, get them, gets them excited about doing it, but more important, it gives them direction about how to do it. Because I can tell you, if I was a second year lawyer sitting in a boardroom and, you know, the head of my practice group said, okay, uh, here's what we're going to do. We're all going to go out and, and uh, develop three new clients. All right, let's go. Uh, I can pretty well tell you, uh, that meeting is going to lead to nothing happening because the people who don't know how to do it don't suddenly know how to do it. So really, I think I think what you need to do is help them along with skills. Um, you know, I used to take my associates for lunch or for coffee, and we just we would just talk about who they knew, who they'd like to meet, maybe who in the firm could help them meet the people they wanted to meet. Um, so, so if you're constantly if you're training people to you have to train them to think differently you have to change the way their brain works about this stuff because nobody comes to it naturally you come to it by trying 10 things and you find out three of them work for you so what works for me won't necessarily work for you sandra and, and vice versa yeah. but what what we each need to tap into is what works for for us based on our personalities and if you can do that you know th there's nothing like a win like a single win to get somebody motivated to do it again. So I love that. It's this mentoring on business development, not just on the technical side of law. Right mm -hmm. from the beginning, right from the beginning, so that they, you know, they, they don't even see that as a level they need to graduate towards. It is part of the job. 
Yeah, no, I had a few partners who even when I was still just a jun very junior, like I, I may have been a first year lawyer, they would drag me, the partners would drag me along to the meetings. So I got to watch them in action for how to handle a client meeting. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't get the benefit of it for another few years, yeah. but I, I was watching. And the other thing that I was learning in some cases was how not to do it. I'd watch somebody and watch the client's reaction and see it wasn't working and say, okay, I'm not doing that. Right. Which sometimes can be just as valuable. Yeah. So you use this little phrase, which is one of my favorite phrases, um, what works for you, as opposed to what works for anybody else. And, you know, I've heard that there are some law firms who have, they have metrics when it comes to business development. They just sort of slap the same metric across the board. Oh, we want this many blogs or we want what whatever, um, you know, phone calls, whatever it is, attend events from everybody. And that's very awkward because as you just said, some people may be less comfortable with speaking. Some people may be more comfortable with uh, writing, whatever it is. If they're given a little bit of wiggle room, each individual may actually find a more sustainable way of doing business development. If they're able to do it in a way that fits with their character, with their mm -hmm. interests. And so I was just wondering, you know, between the two extremes, like, one extreme is let everybody go do whatever they want in, in inside a firm. And the other extreme of, you no, know, they all have to do the same thing. Maybe somewhere in the middle is a happier place where we have some cohesion between the two. You know, do you have any experience with that, that idea? Well, like, I mean, it doesn't make sense for everybody to be doing the same thing. So, mm -hmm. for example, some people are really, particularly these days, uh, just just to show, show I'm not completely over the hill. But uh, I'm a firm believer in social media. I spend a lot of time in LinkedIn. I'm trying to develop a YouTube presence. And what I would say is you need to, to experiment, see what you're good at, what you're bad at. So some people are particularly good in front of a camera. And to them, I would say, you know, you can do a lot of social media marketing uh, on video. Like just, you know, put out, put out your podcast, put out your, uh, 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 go, even go on YouTube if you want, go on LinkedIn Live, uh, do a, you know, once a month, uh, uh, you know, three minutes on, uh, three minutes on the law or three minutes on something you didn't know, or six minutes on something you didn't know. And does, you know, it doesn't take a lot to produce that and just get it out there because the key is uh, brand recognition. And build, and these days it's building audience. These are things that you know. Twenty five years ago, we didn't even know what that was. It was, in, and even ten years ago, I didn't believe in any of this stuff. I thought it was a complete waste of time. But uh, I, I've changed my mind. Uh, for others, it may be blogging. Like you may be a really good writer. You may have be very thoughtful. So you know, start a blog. You know, and, and try to figure out how to build a presence. Um, there was one lawyer who, um, a couple of the young lawyers online who I met through LinkedIn. Uh, have become, you know, I would say they they become uh, heroes to me in terms of what they did. One was a, one was a, he was starting his first day at a major firm, and had no idea where he was going, what he was doing. He was scared out of his mind. He broadcast from his car because he arrived at work half an hour early, so he did a little broadcast in his car, uh, just talking about the feelings of day one. And it was a complete experiment. He'd never done any of this before. It went out and of course it went viral because he had tapped into, um, he had tapped into an entire generation's angst about starting. And, and I asked him, I said, so, you know, so ultimately what's the, what was the, um, the net result of all this? He said, believe it or not, I started doing it on a pretty regular basis. And now I do something every day. Uh, aside from my practice and you wouldn't believe it he said but uh, he works at an international firm I get referrals from all over the world now because everybody knows me wow. uh, he's a junior lawyer wow. you know, not even a partner but people know I'm here uh, because they've heard of me and if you don't think that that doesn't get the attention of the partners well guess what so 
uh, I would say, you know, tap experiment, but you know, tap into don't don't do something where you look at it and say, I will fail at this. I for that I would say actually try it, do some videos, see how you look, um, and practice a few times. You you may find out that what you're terrible at today, uh, three years from now, you're the you know the, the world expert at in knowing how to do. So a lot of it is just figuring figuring out how to do it. But I'd say young people come with the technological skills already. An old fart like me had to learn it. I mean, and believe me, that that was not easy. But you know, but I I didn't feel I had a choice. So you take it on, you make a hundred mistakes, you'll eventually figure it out. But but ultimately, when you're starting, play to your strengths. If you write well, blog. If you show up on camera well and are very comfortable speaking, uh, go out and and share share your legal life, share your personal life, share whatever you want. But ultimately, it's about building following, and that is you know that's that's the the present of building building practices. It's name and reputation. In the old days, you know, in the very old days, like when I was uh, starting out, it was about, you know, what conference can you speak at? What paper can you publish? Is the journal esteemed enough to get you some notoriety? Uh, and then, and the one thing now that that's the big word now, which is repurpose, uh, has always been a big thing, like repurposing material rather than writing things from scratch all the time. Take something you've written, See how you can repurpose it for something else. Uh, see how you can cut it up. Now they talk about uh, you know doing a thirty-minute video and then repurposing it into a whole bunch of shorts and then you know repurposing it at, at again and releasing it at different times and building audience that way, audience and expertise. So it's it's doable, and certainly for the young people coming up, I'm not telling them anything actually that they probably don't already know about or how to do. Uh, but it's, you know, if you're hesitating, uh, don't, because it's going to be useful to your career and possibly in a way t that you can't even imagine today. Mm -hmm. So one of the big messages here today is about trying to do these things early in your career and don't stop at the first sign of failure. Yeah, and never stop, never stop. Right, never stop. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Exactly. Just keep I think going. That's the point. And you're never too old. Mm -hmm. you're never too old to learn something. I mean, the, the big problem most, I think, most practitioners face is we all start knowing nothing. Uh, so we're not embarrassed to say we know nothing. And the more expertise we pick up in a particular area, uh, the more worried we become about people finding out we don't know anything in the broad in, in the areas outside of our narrow expertise. And the more you can push that out obviously the the more value valuable you become but some of us uh, as as we age or as we become more senior become way more embarrassed about the things that we say to ourselves i should have learned this by now and i and i haven't so i'm just gonna hope hope nobody ever asks me yeah i run into this all the time you know with all levels of um uh, professional uh, professional practice and it's this idea of not wanting to say I don't know and one of one of the things that puts people at ease is understanding that it's okay to say I'll get back to you on that or I know somebody who's an expert I'll connect you with that person and that also is added value you don't need to know everything Sorry. you just you just need to know who to know <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> or where to that, look or where to right. look for the answer Right. Wow. And clients don't want the answer like immediately. But much as it sounds like they want it immediately, they, they would actually prefer a little thought thoughtful reflection before you uh before you text back uh the answer you haven't even checked yet. I mean and that's part of the challenges one of the challenges of technology now. We are so trained to, you know, be doing this with our devices and you know, tap, 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 tap. And we get it. It, it triggers something in our brain that we need to respond immediately. And you, you actually don't, it's particularly when the client does it at two in the morning, um, uh, which is a whole other subject we could talk about one day. But but ultimately, it's about uh, taking taking a little bit of time to reflect or saying, yeah, let me get back to you on that. It's, it's uh, I may have some additional questions. 
but I want to think about it for a few hours and and always finish with you know you know what's your timeline on this mm -hmm. it comes to the you know are you are you doing this to get it off your desk or are you doing this because it's an emergency and uh, I shouldn't be guessing whether it's an emergency mm -hmm. so I love all these ideas and how they sort of make the I guess our old version of what is business development which you know it's it, it the 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 idea that comes to mind for me is the person who just picks up the phone okay that's the only thing that they can do but today we have so many other things that you can do it doesn't mean don't pick up the phone but you can do all these other things so that by the time you pick up the phone people already know you they've yeah. seen your linkedin post they've seen your video they attended your event whatever it is they they feel like they know you mm -hmm. and the other thing is uh, and particularly with lawyers more than any other professionals is we are as a species far more brittle than the average population uh we are we we feel rejection easily and sometimes we'll even assume it like i won't make the call because the real reason why you won't make the call is because you're afraid of rejection you're afraid that whoever it is you're reaching out to is going to say no thank you mm -hmm which you translate into, I don't like you because, because we're lawyers, we tend to do that. We see it all so personally, but, but the reality is, and you know, this, this I certainly learned as an author, but it, it, I also learned it as a professional. Um, it's not a bad thing to get a no or to get a, let me think about it with this less, let me think about it usually means no. Uh, but the, the person who's going to succeed, the entrepreneur who's going to succeed isn't going to give up with one no and sometimes no turns into not yet I, I had one client I still remember I was trying to get them for for five years as a client and I thought like I had I had contacts there uh and they were they were a client of a you know a, a very good firm so it's not like a, it was going to be easy for me but I just felt like I should be getting them as a client and I couldn't and you know and i i did everything i possibly could i learned i learned the insides and outs of the company and uh and i and, and i was just a pretty senior lawyer at the time but i was failing and failing and failing and uh, you know it's, it's sometimes i think about it i'd say like this is this is almost embarrassing um the degree at which i failed and then one day uh, i got wind that someone was looking an, an american was looking at investing in the company so i ran down to los angeles again through through a network of a, somebody who I knew who knew the person who was leading the investment group and I said introduce me you know, please introduce us and we we met down in Los Angeles and this and the you know the plane the, the plane ride was in the hotel we were going to be on me although I uh, uh, although I arranged to meet with some other clients while, while I was down there and uh we started talking and after about an hour he said listen will you shut up because I just I kept asking him questions do you, you know do you know this about the company do you know this about the company do you know this about the company and he he realized after a very short period I knew he wanted to invest in the company and I knew way more about that company than he did uh so I got hired and that you know that became uh you know a seven-figure client of the firm for over 20 years whoa I love that story this is this is persistence and determination and I don't know reframing failure that's it like you just you just can't give up and you know if you think you're on the right track don't give up but the, the worst thing we can do is you know somebody puts us off and we say okay forget it mm -hmm. you know, I'm never calling again why because we don't like rejection Mm -hmm. like, if you want to learn rejection become an author for a while and then you then you can really <laughs> learn how to deal with rejection um but 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 that's just part of it. most most professionals aren't willing to hang in there and if if you are you know if you can train yourself not to see it as rejection just as uh this isn't this see it you have to see it as investment everything you do is an investment as, and we started with uh everything you're doing is for three to five years from now and wh why is that because certainly it went, once you become a partner what you'll find out is every five years or so you're going to lose a significant client mm -hmm. so you know they're going to get bought or um uh, or they're going to go bankrupt or any one of any one of a number of things that 
just are good, or or the the chief in house counsel is going to change to somebody who likes has a friend in another firm and suddenly you've lost the client, mm -hmm. and you need to always be assuming that's going to be the case. So you always need to be planning out for you know who's the client that's going to replace them in five years, and I can tell you it happened to be like I lost pretty much every single major client I ever had. So it's just a, a practical tip when it comes to business planning that you should put that into your projections. Yes. It takes some of the guesswork out. Yeah. And that's um, the, the good news is when your contacts switch firms, like you know, the key person at this firm may move, that puts your current relationship at work. But you're gonna what you're going to do is help that person find their next position so you can translate it into something else and maybe it'll even be better. Mm -hmm. I, but I think you have to walk around assuming, you know, somebody's trying to plant the knife in your back. Here's what your a point. lovely visual. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I feel like we had a wonderful discussion, but Norm, is there anything you, you want to say that we haven't touched on? Um, like not, nothing jumps to mind, but if you, if you even said one word, I'd come up with, <laughs> I just Build be off synergies. running in a direction. <laughs> hey, here's the word synergies. Uh, there, there you go. Um, and and that may wrap everything up. And most people don't understand what synergy. Like they throw the word, word synergies around. Um, but the reality is, you're you know you're going to do your best with uh, people who you connect with. Mm -hmm. And those pe those people are ultimately are your biggest assets. You know, and, and it could be a partner in your firm. Uh, it could be somebody who sends you referral work. It could be an accountant you deal with, uh, or it could be a, a client, a particular client contact or a series of client contacts. Uh, and I can guarantee you in 10 years, uh, you, you know, your core group at a single company could be at 10 different places. And you always have, you know, that's why the, the personal relationships are, are key, because one or two of those people could be your next big break. And, and that's why, so, so bring it back to the point where we started, which is, you know, how do you teach business development? How do you go from where you are, which is a know nothing to, uh, you know, to someone who's the rainmaker? And the short answer is it's a, two, a combination of two things. One, you got, you have to build your expertise. You just have to get sp smarter at something than everybody else. And the wonderful thing about these days is that, uh, with the with the speed at the, the pace the technology is moving and that the world is changing something new is coming up on, on on a regular basis and the nice thing about something new is um for all the experts at what exists now uh we have no not we have no more knowledge about the new thing than you do so you can become it's your opportunity to become the expert at that new thing if you're interested in it uh, on the same basis as me, who's been at it for 35 years. So if you, you know, if you can get there among the first, if you can build your expertise up quickly, it helps if you like whatever it is you're, uh, you know, that you're into, though that creates immediate opportunities for Frank, frankly, better opportunities for younger people than older people. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that's one of the things you need to be focused on is, you know, what's changing, um, the, the one thing I learned through my own practice, which was in, in film finance on the tax side, uh, when I started out was in, in the, in the entertainment industry, like nobody was doing it because nobody thought it was the least bit valuable. And most of my, every time I had to research something, there was no answer. So after five years of opining on all these things for which there are no answers, guess what? I was the expert. Mm -hmm. It didn't mean I was right. It just meant I was the only person who <laughs> was putting out an answer to something. <laughs> so it became the answer. Uh, and then, and you know, that makes you the go-to person. So, you know, find your niche. It's, it's, you know, find your niche. That's what, that's what I'd say as part of your business development plan, find your niche, niche, push it, believe in yourself, keep pushing it, keep expanding the niche and your expertise. And that's where to start. And then it's all, everything after that is about, uh you know how well you connect with people yes and i i love that message i think it's it's uh again empowering but also there's an underlying message in there which is you don't have to do it the way others have done it and and that can be a real obstacle when when people get it in their head 
that, oh, they have to copy somebody else in order to be successful, either their leadership style or their rainmaking style or whatever their business development plan, whatever it is, you don't have to copy what someone else is doing. You can do something no one has done before and be tremendously successful. Yeah, what you have to do is fit it to your personality. I think that's that's mm-hmm. that's what it is. And but ex- but accept as well, you know, that who you are today isn't going to be who you are ten years from now. Mm-hmm. So you know, don't the, the worst thing you can do is box yourself and saying I am this. Right. Uh, and I can tell you that's you know that that norm at the end of four years was I am this. You know, just put me in a corner, let me do some research, and I'll be fine. And, you know, norm as little as two years later was, how do I get out there? What's my message? Who am I going to? Uh, I'm, you know, I'm going to speak in, in, in front of a crowd of 50 uh, of that crowd. Who are my targets that I'm going to follow up with afterwards? And once you start changing the way you think, you start changing. So, like, don't, the, the worst thing you can do is box yourself and say, I'm too quiet. I'm too shy. Right. That, was me. that was me. That was me, you know, until... Uh, till I was 28, I think. And then, you know, something changed. And I said, okay, I, you know, I can learn how to act. I can, that's the one thing, you know, take, you know, if you, if you don't have the skills, if you're afraid to get on stage, you know, take impromptu, take, do an impromptu class, take some acting lessons. Uh, Toastmasters. Toastmasters, that's it. Just get some practice and then watch some people who are really good at it. Yeah. Whatever it is you want to do and say, okay, what do they do? Just break down what they're doing. Watch what you're doing, then practice, and then guess what? You're going to get better. Yeah. Very good. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Norm, for your time and insights. This was really, yeah, (laughs) (laughs) a very fun conversation. And to our listeners, if you are interested in learning more about Norman Bacall, please go to normanbacall.com. You've been listening to Get in the Driver's Seat, stories about leadership moments in small to mid-sized professional practices. I'm your host, Sandra Beckor, Practice Management Coach at Beckor Management. Take care, everybody.